I'd first like to discuss cryptocurrencies because we had seen a pullback in cryptocurrencies. Um, Bitcoin had risen to about 3,000 and then it pulled back to about um, 1,800, I believe. Now we're seeing them rise again in the past uh, week or so. What is your perspective on the cryptocurrency market right now? Uh, well, it's definitely exciting. Uh, it's been uh, uh, quite the year. It was really uh, just this year that all these things really took off uh, from their levels where they were at. Uh, Bitcoin last year was in the in the range of five hundred to eight hundred dollars. Uh, Ethereum uh, started last year, two thousand sixteen, at two dollars, and that's when we recommended it to our subscribers at the Dollar Vigilante. Uh, it hit four hundred dollars, uh, and now it's back down to uh, around two hundred. Uh, so absolutely massive swings. Um, We've just seen a – it's actually been shocking to me, the amount of interest in the cryptocurrencies. I expected that we would see that, but not uh, this quickly. Um, I expected Bitcoin to do quite well, and it has, of course. We started recommending it at $3 in 2011. I hit 3000 It's now around 2700 I believe. And uh, But I did not expect these uh, alternative uh, cryptocurrencies or altcoins, as they call them, to do so phenomenally so quickly. We've seen so many, and of course, we've been covering a number of them, including Dash at around 17. It's around 200 right now. Uh, so we've seen a massive, massive uh, run-up. Uh, we've seen uh, it's been about 10 times the market cap in, in the last year. Uh, the uh, the cryptocurrencies right now are at close to $100 billion total, including Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies. So it's been uh, quite quite the amazing uh, time and, and ride uh, and been quite volatile. So it's, it's definitely been interesting. Definitely. And what is your perspective? A lot of people are saying that this is a bubble. What is your perspective on when people say that? Uh, well, as we know, bubbles are really caused by the central banks and money printing. And so I, there are some people who say that so the cryptocurrencies are effectively like the tech stocks of 1999 right now. Uh, they could definitely be uh, – that could be part of it, absolutely. The uh, the Federal Reserve has been uh, 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 printing money and expanding the money supply massively for, for a decade now. Uh, so we definitely could be seeing uh, some of that money leak into this market. But the one thing to remember here is how small this market is. I just said the entire market cap of all cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, is $100 billion. So just about the amount that Bill Gates is worth. So uh, th that has to be kept in mind. We also should keep in mind it is a small market, so it can move quite a bit uh, and can, can be quite volatile. And we've definitely seen that. Uh, so uh, these are things to keep in mind. As far as it being a bubble, I said before that I don't think Bitcoin is in a bubble at all. I, I said last year when Bitcoin was around $700, so I was uh, asked what I believed it would go to in 2017, or what, what its high would be in 2017. And I believe I said 2,700 or 2,900. Uh, whichever one it was, they've both been hit now. It, it uh, peaked just above 3,000 uh, about a month ago. Uh, so I don't see Bitcoin as being in a bubble. Uh, I, th I think that given the amount of uh, exposure it's been getting, the amount of demand, the amount of people waking up to how important it is, uh, that that is uh, fairly uh, um, – should be expected of Bitcoin to go to these sort of levels. Now, when it comes to the other cryptocurrencies, they absolutely could be getting into bubble territory. Absolutely. You have Ethereum, which we recommended at $2 in 2016, hit 400. It's now at 200, but that's still a uh, massive, massive, absolutely massive gain. And many of these other cryptocurrencies have as well. So uh, it's definitely possible that some of these cryptocurrencies are definitely in bubble territory, but I would say Bitcoin isn't in particular. Now, I know the last time we had you on, you were talking about how some governments were trying to control Bitcoin, and especially the Chinese government. Can you give us an update on this? Well, all governments and all central banks have a great interest in trying to stop or slow down or get rid of cryptocurrencies because – all governments have central banks, or most of them anyway. Uh, the ones who don't are places like Libya and Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know if anyone notices there are any connect the dots there, but that's that's where the U.S. seems to attack all the time because uh, they want to put in central banks. In fact, after NATO, the North Atlantic Terrorist Organization, attacked Libya, uh, the very next day after they attacked it, they put in a central bank. So it's very obvious what they're trying to do. So they want to have central banks in all these countries. And of course, all the governments today are all bankrupt, all the Western governments at least, and uh, almost every government I've ever looked at is bankrupt. So they all stay alive just by printing money, so they really need the central banks. Uh, so these, uh, they, they work hand in hand in, in, in essence. So 
Uh, governments and central banks both have a great interest in making sure that cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin don't do well because if people start using those things and gold and silver instead of the fiat currencies that are uh, forced upon people by the government um, and forced that they have to use them under legal tender laws and then forced into a banking system which is totally – Corrupt and, and run by a central bank, which is a tenet of communism, which essentially centra uh, centrally plans the entire economy and monetary system, and then they institute laws like fractional reserve banking, which is totally fraudulent. Uh, they want people in all those things because those things they benefit from, but they don't benefit from something like Bitcoin, which has a limited supply and uh, no one can control. So they absolutely want to try to get rid of it. But the beautiful, great thing about these things, and that's why it's so important and why, why they're so great, is you really can't. There's, there is no Bitcoin office. There is no Bitcoin CEO. It all exists generally in the cloud. So really the only way to stop it is uh, to turn off the power or the Internet. Uh, and that's uh, if that happened, we're going to have major problems way bigger than – no one will be worrying about Bitcoin if they turn off the power for an extended period of time. We've already seen what happens in the U.S. when they turn off the EBT cars just for a few hours. There's literally riots on the street in the now very socialist uh, U.S. where so many people are on government assistance. Uh, so uh, we'll see what happens, but they definitely uh, want to stop uh, cryptocurrencies, but they can't. Uh, the other way that they could uh, try to stop things like Bitcoin is by in introducing laws which, make, which essentially force people using guns. That's all government is to say, if you use this, we're going to kidnap you, which is called, they call arresting you and put you in a rape camp, which they call jail. Uh, and uh, so they could do that. But the more that they try to do that, the more people wake up to realize just how evil uh, and uh, uh, their governments are. Uh, they're like, why would they <laughs> put me in jail just for using this computer money? Uh, people will start to look into it. They'll start to look into what central banking is. They'll really start to wake up. And we've seen some of the countries that have tried to put in laws against Bitcoin, and Russia's one of them, Thailand's another, China's another. Uh, they haven't really worked out that well because you really can't stop it. And it, it, there's ways you can deal in cryptocurrencies that it's really hard for anyone to find out you've been uh, buying or selling them. So uh, for that reason, they really just can't stop it. So it's, it's really interesting. And I, I just it's a constant daily uh, interest to see how governments and central banks, what they're doing to try to deal with this threat of cryptocurrencies. Right. And I know you were recently on an interview and you were you were talking about the potential of cryptocurrencies and really the potential of them really replacing central banks. You were talking about how technology is just changing the world how the biggest taxi company, Uber, has no taxis. The biggest hotel company, Airbnb, has no hotels. Um, I'm not sure if they're actually the biggest yet. Uh, I guess you can correct me on, on that if they're not. But, I mean, they're really huge. And, you know, Uber has no taxis and Airbnb has no hotels. And just how technology is changing the world. Did you want to discuss a little bit about the potential of cryptocurrencies really re replacing government money? Yeah, absolutely. And you didn't mention Amazon, the biggest retailer, has no real stores. Uh, so we live in the truly digital age now. It's it's really happening, the digital age. Uh, and uh, so what makes perfect sense in a digital age but digital money? And what even makes more sense is a digital money that can't be controlled by governments or central banks and that you can transfer literally a billion dollars to China right now in a few seconds for almost no cost and no one can stop it and no one can seize those funds. It's absolutely beautiful. You know, it really is a matter of if people just start using them uh, more and more, and we're seeing that. That's what's been the big deal with Bitcoin in the last few months is so many people across the world have been using Bitcoin that its uh, network demands have gone up dramatically and it wasn't able to handle it all. So that's been a big issue and that's why some of the other cryptocurrencies have been catching up lately is because there's been delays in increasing the capacity of the Bitcoin network uh, through software changes essentially uh, to be able to handle the increased capacity. So we're seeing a major amount of still not big. It's still not like an uh, amount that's uh, world changing. You're still not seeing people the, uh, everywhere in the world using it on a daily basis. But people are starting to uh, wake up to it and starting to use it. And as they start to do that, uh, they will use less and less the government fiat money. And uh, it, just like anything, it's all supply and demand. If people really want the Bitcoin, they're going to have to get it. And that's going to increase a huge amount of demand on Bitcoin. Uh, they'll, they'll have less demand for things like dollars or whatever current uh, go, uh, uh, government currency they have in their country. Uh, so the the, the uh, value of those things will just go down. So this could spiral very quickly. And of course, with 
cryptocurrencies, it's quite easy to hide a lot of your transactions, especially uh, with some of the other cryptocurrencies, not just Bitcoin. Uh, and so that will, and Barack Obama even said last year that this is, uh, poses a huge threat to government tax collection or extortion, as I call it. And uh, he said it's like everyone in the world would have a Swiss bank account in their pocket. And it's actually much, much better than that. It's better than a Swiss bank account because you're not reliant on any Swiss bank to make sure that you have your funds. It's actually you hold your own money. You become your own bank. So this is absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think as people catch on to it and start using it, uh, it, I know for me personally, when I first started using it, the very first day I, I, I used it, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. Like, it's so fast. There's no one, like, you can go and open a Bitcoin account uh, in a matter of a few seconds. You can just go to blockchain.info, for example, just type in your whatever you want. And there you go. Two seconds, you got your Bitcoin account. If someone wants to send you Bitcoin, you just send them your address. In a few seconds, you're going to have the Bitcoin. And then if you want to buy anything, and there's so many things you can buy with Bitcoin now, including Expedia and all kinds of things. And if you can get Bitcoin debit cards now so you can spend your Bitcoin at stores and stuff like that. Uh, so you can spend it in a matter of seconds. So this is so much better than anything else. PayPal has uh, major expenses for transfers. Western Union is far, far worse. So it's going to get rid of the entire uh, remittance market. Uh, and then banking is getting harder and harder. It's so hard to even open a bank account now. You have to tell them exactly what you had for breakfast, basically, just to get the account open. And uh, they, uh, it's so hard. And there's also these transaction fees. And they're so slow. That's uh, uh, you know, I, I try to transfer money into Bitcoin exchanges to buy Bitcoin from banks. And it's like two, three days. Oh, it's the weekend. Well, it's closed. Well, Bitcoin's never closed. Bitcoin is 24-7, 365, no cost. So it just makes total sense for everyone to just start using it. And that's really all it's going to take is more and more people getting exposed to it and just realizing this is a better money. And that, in, in essence, makes the government money and central banks obsolete. Definitely. And I know there's still a lot of skepticism out there. And I have to confess that I'm one of the skeptics also. I, I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I guess I see some of the potential there, but I see still a great difference between gold and silver which has historically been you know considered real money and have intrinsic value and something like bitcoin that just seems like yes it's scarce but it doesn't seem to have intrinsic value and scarcity in my mind doesn't equal value um you need something actually there that is of value so what is your perspective on that because I know a lot of people in the sound money community say that, you know, for 5,000 years, gold and silver have not fallen to zero and they're the ultimate safe haven asset um, in times of crisis. And it just seems like Bitcoin to me doesn't have that track record and has the potential and other cryptocurrencies has have the potential of falling to zero. So what is your perspective on that? Uh, well, absolutely. There's there's reasons to be cautious with them. Bitcoin was only founded or started in 2009, so we're eight years into it. Uh, all the other cryptocurrencies are just a few years old. We've already seen with Bitcoin all the problems that it can have and does continue to have on an ongoing basis. People fighting over which, uh, how Bitcoin's going to work and stuff like that. Uh, so absolutely, I, if I had a, a billion dollars, uh, I would not put it all into Bitcoin. That'd be absolutely crazy. It could go to zero if we see some major hack that we're totally Totally unexpected if we see parts of the internet go down, if we see quantum computing increase by a massive amount. But you could say the same thing generally about gold in general. You could say some people have been talking for a while, well, what if the al alchemists can create gold out of you know 3D printers and stuff like that? Yeah, well, that would make gold pretty much uh, instantly worthless. So uh, everything has some risks and, and uh, obviously some rewards. Uh, but I, uh, I, I definitely uh, am a huge proponent of gold and silver. Uh, the thing is that when you ask about what's the actual intrinsic value of Bitcoin, in this day and age where we have governments and central banks across the world, uh, the government's taxing you, the central bank's inflating the currencies, uh, the value of Bitcoin is it's the world's largest supercomputer network uh, that uh, creates a currency that has uh, – almost z like very low transaction costs and almost instant uh, transactions that no one can stop. That has a, a massive amount of value. And Bitcoin itself was actually modeled after gold. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he was, in his uh, writings, uh, talked a lot about how it was modeled after gold, and that's why you have to mine Bitcoins. Uh, and so there's a lot of work that has to be put in to actually create a Bitcoin, the same as there is a lot of work that needs to be put in to get an ounce of gold. You have capital costs, you have electricity costs uh, for the Bitcoin uh, uh, to run the, the mining rigs. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, you know, they're, they're quite similar, uh, gold and, and uh, Bitcoin. Uh, the difference is uh, the cryptocurrencies are very new and 
can change rapidly. And but the the thing is, it could go to zero. It also could go to a million dollars of Bitcoin if. Bitcoin becomes used as the world currency that everyone uses. I've already done the math on it. If it supplants the U.S. dollar as a currency that everyone uses, and we're not talking that's going to happen next month, but if that happens in five or ten years, uh, Bitcoin will be worth in today's dollars about a million dollars of Bitcoin. That's just based on supply and demand. Uh, it also could go to zero. So it's one of those things. So at the Dollar Vigilante, we actually have uh, had a recommendation to keep 90% of your assets in gold and silver and gold and silver related things and other hard assets and only 10% uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, so it's it's uh, not a massive amount, but as I just said, if the cryptocurrencies really take off, and I expect that they will, unless something unexpected happens, uh, that you can have massive gains on them anyway. Uh, but as far as the the competition between gold and silver and Bitcoin, I don't really see it as competition. I see them as being very very complementary. For me personally, I have a lot of gold and silver, but I also have a, quite a bit of Bitcoin, and I really like having that Bitcoin because I can transfer that anywhere in the world whenever I want, and no one can. Can ever steal it. I, you can actually store it all in your own brain uh, by memorizing your passphrase. Whereas with gold, you have to store it somewhere. If it's in your backyard, someone could find it. Uh, if it's in a vault somewhere in a bank, uh, the government could confiscate it as the US government did in 1933. If you want to try transferring some gold to China for something you want to buy there, good luck. That's just not really going to happen. So they're very complementary. I see Bitcoin more as a transactionary sort of a mechanism and gold and silver is more of a uh, 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 wealth store sort of a mechanism uh, but they both have values and now we have things uh, like cryptocurrencies that are backed by gold coming out so you can actually transfer your gold uh, digitally uh, via the blockchain uh, with uh, various other cryptocurrencies coming out so it's all very interesting but I absolutely don't see them as competition whatsoever I see them as highly highly complementary that's very interesting I didn't know um, a lot of people are still skeptical including me and it's it's good to have an appropriate amount of skepticism but then again you pointed out how um, people who are, you know, skeptical of the internet and you're thinking that cryptocurrencies are going to be the biggest things since the internet. Yeah, I've said that. I was around for the internet, so I've seen it already. And I was, I started Canada's largest financial website, Stockhouse.com, in 1993. And I remember going around in 1994 and uh, trying to sell people on getting websites and things like that. And I'd walk into a CEO's office and I'd say, your company needs a website. And they'd go, what's a website? And I'd say, it's on the internet. And they'd go, what's the internet? And uh, I had just quit my job at a bank and people said, you're crazy. This internet thing's just a fad. It's not going to catch on. And I was like, no, I'm I know this is not a fad. And uh, I, I ended up um, getting my company worth $240 million by the height of the tech bubble. It all collapsed after that, of course. And that's when I learned about central banking. And that's how I got into what I'm doing today at the Dollar Vigilante, trying to warn people about that and getting people into things like gold, silver, and cryptocurrencies to protect themselves from uh, the central banks and their, their constant booms and busts. Uh, but uh, so I've, I've seen the Internet come out and uh, I when I saw Bitcoin, I first found out about it at 2011 at three dollars. And I, it seems exactly the same to me as the uptake of the Internet. In the first few years, no one even knew what it was, just the same way that in 1994, no, no one knew what a website was or what the Internet was. Uh, a couple of years ago, people started to catch on to it, but they were still they were not really on it. That was sort of the same as like 1996, 1997. Some people started to get email, but they weren't really on the Internet. And it wasn't really around 90, until about 1999, 2000 that people really started using the Internet quite a bit. Uh, and we're, I don't think we're even at that point with cryptocurrencies yet. I kind of compare the uh, cryptocurrency market in comparison to the Internet. We're at about 1997, 1998 right now. Uh, so I, we haven't seen that massive uh, uh, amount of people getting onto the cryptocurrencies yet. So I expect that's still to come. And if that happens, we all know what happened with the tech stocks in 1999. So that could happen with the cryptocurrencies. And I don't think it's happened yet. Right, definitely. I mean, I think if, if cryptocurrencies are going to be as big as the Internet, it's, we're still way, way in the beginning stages of it because apart from, you know, the people I interview, I don't think I know, I might know one person who's invested in cryptocurrencies. Besides that, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's really looked into it at all or even has any. Um, but Jeff Berwick, thank you so much for joining us today.